So Isaac, we're getting the chance to talk to what is like a modern day Galileo. So Galileo had a new technology, they had the telescope, and he was able to look up and see things in the sky that no one had seen before, the moons around Jupiter. And what Mike Brown has done is he's taken computer programs and now the digital technology of photography, and he's been able to bring those together to start seeing and discovering things that no one saw before. So he's found over 29 minor planets up around and beyond Pluto. And that's what ended up leading to the demotion of Pluto because there were so many other similar objects he, he found like that. But his discoveries had led him to a search for the ninth planet. Because of his research, he's seen that there's strong evidence that there is a bigger ninth planet farther outside, even beyond where Pluto is. These objects in the outer solar system are all reacting to something. But what? How did you get interested in space? Oh, that's, that's an easy one to answer. I, I've been interested in space for as long as I can remember, since I was the, uh, a young child. And I think it's because I, I grew up in northern Alabama, um, where at the time, in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, they were building the Saturn V rockets to go to the moon. So almost it seemed like everybody in town was working on, on those rockets and everybody in town was really excited about going to the moon. My father worked on the rockets. Um, so I just, I always, always wanted to, to, to work in space, be an astronaut, be an astronomer, do something to do with space. I love the story that you shared in your book about being a 15 year old and noticing two stars that kind of caught your attention that were moving. Could you tell us a little bit about that experience and how that shaped a lot of what has led to your discoveries today? I, I just kept on looking up and noticing these, these two stars in the sky that were super bright. And I realized over, over time as I was watching them that they were, they were moving, that this was actually Jupiter and Saturn making uh, a close approach like they do once every 30 years or something. Um, so it just that they happened to be that moment close enough together to, to notice their movements and, and draw my attention. And uh, it's just, it was just kind of this amazing, you know, almost like discovering it for myself that like, wow, these things are out there moving across the sky. That's crazy. What did you do as a kid that you think helps you now during work? I tell you, the, the, um, the most important thing that I did as a kid is something that I spend almost all of my time doing at work, it seems like. So when I was, when I was in high school, um, I bought one of the very early first computers, TRS-80, um, that, that people had in their houses and I learned to program it. And I just thought it was super fun to sit around and make, I, I made my own video games and all these, uh, adventure games and all this stuff. Um, but I just liked doing the computer programming and that has been, it's really what I do most of the day and the night, it seems like is that computer programming. So I'm super glad that I learned it back when I did. When you went to school and you were learning astronomy, you were taught that there was nothing beyond Pluto, at least planets within our solar system. Why didn't you believe everybody? Like what led you to say, no, I think there might be something out there and I want to go find it. So I was as surprised as anybody else when um, astronomers started finding these tiny objects um, in the vicinity of Pluto. So it was that moment when I realized that, that people were finding these tiny ones and that they don't looked in, in small patches of the sky. That was the moment when I realized, oh, there must be some really, really large things still to be found out there. I, I remember reading about your first experience where you took years gathering the images to then push through a computer software program you built. And the software program only took a couple hours, but it took years to get the right images into there. But then you had 8,000 different possibilities that you had to then go through and test yourself. So tell us a little bit about how there's still complexity amid using this new software and figuring out the right ways to apply that to the old technology as you find these new things. Yes, I would say a lot of it is, is that uh, you you're always pushing the, the, the software and the algorithms as, as far as you can. The further you can push it, the more things you'll be able to discover. And so I, I spend a lot of my time trying to develop new algorithms and then you tune it and tune it and tune it until it's as fast as it can. And then you set it loose on as much data as you can get. And then it doesn't work in the first 
27 times for different reasons and you fix this and you fix that and then you run the whole thing and you realize, oh, I wish I'd done this instead. You go back and do it all again. So the the computation being done by the computers is is saved. I don't, we don't have to do that, but instead we're spending all of our time making sure all that happens right because it has to be has to be perfect. If it's not perfect, you'll end up missing what you're looking for. Why didn't you give up? You know, it's hard, and it's a. Uh, even right now, it's um, when I'm when I'm off searching for this new planet out there. It's it's tempting to after a couple of years of not finding it to say, okay, okay, I just I'm, I'm going to quit. I'm going to do something else. Um, but every time I'm thinking that, I realize you know this this is to me the most interesting and most exciting thing that I could be doing. And you know, if somebody else found it instead of me, I would be really depressed. So. Um, so I don't give up. You definitely have a vision to continue to work through this. I mean, years and years you've been going for this. What do you think gives you that vision to keep trying? It's that there's always new things to find. And, you know, I, I, I thought that when we did the exploration of the Kuiper Belt and, and found all of the largest known Kuiper Belt objects, that uh, that that might kind of be the end of this sort of thing that I'm doing. I didn't, it didn't occur to me that there were even more things, bigger things further out there to find. But then when you realize there are, then you realize you, this is, you just have to keep doing it. So it's this continuous realization that there's more and more that, uh, that, that just keeps it going for, I don't know how long, forever, I hope. What do you want to name the ninth planet? So I will tell you, uh, the honest answer is we have not thought of names at all. And the reason we haven't thought of names at all is because we're very superstitious. I think astronomers are actually more superstitious than, than average scientists. And I, I think it's because we have to deal with the weather and the sky and all that stuff. And one of my strongly held superstitions is that if you name something um, before you find it, you'll never find it. So we honestly have thought of no names whatsoever. I'm excited. In the book, you give such thought and meaning to each name of each star that you give. Um, it, it even has me brainstorming, you know, what, what is it going to be? And honestly, we feel like we're rooting. I mean, I'm genuinely excited for that day when your announcement comes that you found it and that it's this huge planet out there that, you know, no one knew was going to be there or no one thought was there. Um, I would love for you to talk a little bit about how creativity plays a role in this problem solving quest you're on of discovery? I, I think it, it's, it's a creativity is, is key because it, it's creativity of, in a couple of different ways. It's creativity just of, of thought of the realization. It's, it's curiosity and creativity. In fact, I would say it's, it's noticing something that's not quite right in this case for the, for searching for planet nine, it was noticing that there are objects out in the Kuiper belt that are behaving in ways that they shouldn't be behaving. And then being curious, then you ask yourself, why? And then comes the creativity. Well, uh, what, are, what are the different possibilities? And you, you go through everything. Um, dismiss the ones that, aren't, that uh, don't make any sense. And this is how we eventually settled on a planet out there. And then... You have to find it. So how are you going to find it? Well, we, we know how to find these things. You go off the telescope and do that, but that's a long, slow process too. So there are other ways to do that. So this is where you just, it's, it's just kind of brainstorming, thinking about everything that could possibly do it and then com coming up with ways to, to do what you have to do. So it's um, the, that process of creativity of, of creating your own possibilities for how to do things is, is kind of what happens all the time. Can you tell us of the role that history plays on a map of motivation for you in your quest? The search for Planet Nine is most analogous to the, the mathematical search that led to this discovery of, of Uranus. And uh, the, or of the parallels Neptune. are... Uh, of, of Neptune. Did I, Uranus was yeah. found... Um, yeah. So using Uranus to discover... Neptune and yeah. um, those those it's 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 amazing all the all the different parallels between you know so people realized there was something funny going on with Uranus 
and then used those observations to predict the location for Neptune. We sort of have done the same thing with finding these funny things going on in the Kuiper belt, using these to predict the location of Planet Nine. Only difference is we haven't found it yet, but we're working on that. Okay, I'm going to try to explain this to Isaac. Can you correct me if I'm wrong on why you believe there is a ninth planet? Okay, so Sedna was a planet that Mike discovered, and it had a really strange orbit around the sun. So imagine a football field, and you know how there's the goalpost on one end? The orbit of Sedna was like the track. It went around the sun, and then it went all the way down to the other side. It goes 10,000 years before it comes back around. And Mike found several other objects that had similar elongated orbits like that. And so they tried to figure out why it was behaving that way. It doesn't make sense. And when they ran models of computer models, you could see that another planet up there could be drawing that kind of gravitational pull of why all those objects are looping out so far while they're, why they're tilted that way is because something is pulling them. And that's that ninth planet. And so they're doing the math to try to say, okay, where would that ninth planet be based on the behavior of these objects that we can see rotating really far out around the sun. That's crazy. It's crazy. It's so exciting. Is that a correct explanation of what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. That's, it that's is a, so that's exciting. Good... I can't <laughs> wait for you to find it. Me too. With such a bold prediction of there being a ninth planet out there, we know that there's haters. You've even had times in the past where other people have, you know, hacked into your system and essentially tried to scoop a planet before you and make the claim of it. How do you deal with that pressure? How do you deal with that controversy to keep going when there's so much opposition? It's still not fun to have uh, have have people, you know, saying, "Ah, oh, I don't believe it." Blah blah blah. But in the end, I don't care. I don't care if people believe it or don't believe it, because this is one of these cases where the the proof is in finding it. When people are like, "Oh, I don't. I think you did this calculation wrong," or "I think that this is not right," I'm like, "Okay, if you." If that's what you think, that's that's what you think. But I'm going to find it, and then you can decide what you think at that point. So as soon as it's found, uh, there's really no argument to be had anymore. So I'm just waiting for that day. When you find other planets, do you want to hold it back, or do you want to like put it out immediately? So this is that's a really interesting question about the when we when we figured out the the mathematical part of it. So we were presented. We, we thought about two different things we could do. First thing we could do is realize it's there, not tell anybody and go find it. And that would mean that we had a, you know, a chance of finding it ourselves before anybody else had any chance because nobody else knew it was out there to be found. Uh, and we thought about that and, and realized that a better thing to do would be to tell everybody about it, tell everybody exactly where we think it is. We've been trying to be as, as open about where it is as possible. And, and anybody who wants to be looking for it can be looking for it and know where the right places to be looking for it are. It's, it means that somebody else may find it because we told them where to look. Um, and that will make me, that will make me sad, I admit. Um, but at the same time, it'll be faster. We want, I want to, I'd rather have this found in a year or two by somebody else than me taking 10 years to find it. So, um, so that's what we've done. And we keep on updating everything we know so that people, have a, have a better and better chance of, of finding it, even if it's not us. Another thing that I loved about your story was the way that you included your family and the experience of your family in the process of your discovery and your failures. So when you were struggling to find anything three years without finding anything out there, you did find the love of your life, Diane, and you married her. You, you tell the engagement story in the book and it's beautiful. And then during that period of time when you were discovering all of these initial big objects, you also had the birth of Lila, your daughter. And you talk about how beautiful the miracle is and the discovery of her learning how to, to talk and learning how to live life. And, and I just, I love the way that you've incorporated family into your personality of discovery. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. But, but the, um, it's, it's the, what I'm thinking about when you're saying this now is, um, you know, how in this, in this moment we're in right now, uh, I'm sitting here, this is my office, um, this is my house, my family is right down the hall, uh, Lila is finishing her freshman year of high school, yeah. um, 
and and this is you know more likely than not uh, this is this this could well be where I am when the discoveries are made. And so she comes. I I I literally I was wrong, but I literally two weekends ago thought that I had found Planet Nine. Um, <laughs> I can't believe you thought you found it and then realized you hadn't. That had to have been devastating. Oh, in the data that I'm analyzing right now, I I had put in a couple of fake Planet Nine tracks just to make sure that my software could find it, and and I found one of those and didn't realize it was a <laughs> fake one. And and oh. uh, Lila was the only person in my house, and I thought I told her this later. Like she was about to be the second human uh, to know to that know. there was this this planet out there and she was like "Ah, we need to come find it but it's but you know she and and diane are are it's just a part of everything i do people sometimes say you know i I wish it's it's hard to keep family and work and everything else separate and i don't i don't really want to i i feel like this is this is me they're me uh i actually i actually really quite like this working at home with my family nearby all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, there are a lot of other problems that it has with it, but it's, but part of it for me is this has been just, a, it would be, it's been delightful. And if I could, if I could find planet nine during this time period too, that would just be, I'd be pretty happy about that. All right. I'm going to try real quick to explain to Isaac the significance of this. So Isaac, only two other people in known history have discovered a planet because Mercury, Venus, verse, verse, <laughs> I'm struggling with the planets. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are all visible by the naked eye. So they've been known since ancient times. But Uranus and Neptune were found by William Herschel. And this was back in like the very the late 1700s. And then in the 1800s, um, Leverrier, Leverrier did the math that led to finding Neptune. So Mike is on a journey to become the third person to find a planet out there. We're just so excited about your journey and we're going to be following along and we can't wait for the announcement. After you do find it, how long does that process take? I mean, again, with the scoop of what happened with Hamea, you know, yeah. how quickly are you like, we're going to tell everyone or you're worried about getting hacked and someone watching in on our Zoom conversation and trying to, you know, announce it first. Yeah, we, 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 will, we will do it. As, as quickly as possible. So here's, imagine that uh, two Saturdays ago, I really had found it, found yeah. it in old data. So so the process would be um, quickly confirm that it's real by by predicting where it should be tonight and finding a telescope to pointing it there. It's hard right now because all telescopes are shut down, but I, we can yeah. find a telescope somewhere. Um, and once we found it, and confirm that it was exactly where we thought it was supposed to be based on the old data. And then, then we would know for a hundred percent sure it was real. We would announce it the next day. So it, it could, it would be days to weeks from the moment of discovery. Mike, we are so excited about your journey. We believe you're going to find the ninth planet. And when we, when you do, we would love to chat with you again about it and get an update on that experience. It's uh, been, been quite fun. Thanks for having me on.